Welcome to The Thought Hackers, the show where you will learn how your mind works and discover how to change your thinking from leading experts and through inspiring stories. Good day, everyone. My name is Nathan Siegel. I'm here with my colleague Hamish Baston out of Australia, and we are The Thought Hackers. With us today is a man by the name of John Elferink. John is a barrister, solicitor, and lobbyist living in Adelaide, Australia. He has worked as a police officer, politician, and minister of one of Her Majesty's governments in Australia. Until a year ago, John served as the Attorney General of the Northern Territory in Australia, also holding the portfolios of Minister for Health, Minister for Mental Health Services, Minister for Disability Services, Minister for Child Protection, and Minister for Corrections in the Northern Territory. He also managed the Parliament on behalf of the Northern Territory Government as leader of government business. John has worked in the international arena as a member of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association with African Nations, Fiji, and the Solomon Islands. During his childhood, John was targeted by a pedophile in the Northern Territory where he grew up. John was apprehended by police as a housebreaker and petty criminal in his early teens. He also struggled with alcohol and drug abuse in his teens and very early 20s, which culminated in a moral, uh, emotional, and spiritual collapse and a new path in life. I'd like to welcome you to the show, John. Well, thank you very much, Nathan. Good day to Hamish in Melbourne. Hi, John. You, you spoke about being targeted by a, a pedophile. How old were you when this happened? Um, I was 12 uh, when he targeted me and that was part of the problem was that I'd already been stealing money at that age because of my wayward childhood um, and as a consequence of that uh, my father decided to make me work for a living to pay back the money and that was a, a good idea except for the fact that the place he placed me was uh, with at the clutches of his pedophile and I had to work for him at that time for $2 an hour to pay the several hundred dollars back that I had stolen. Um, it wasn't long before uh, this particular gentleman saw fit to seduce me, and that's his language, not mine. Um, and as a consequence, of course, the difficulties that I was already having in my home life, um, the fact that I was already drinking liquor at that stage, in fact, I'd started drinking alcohol when I was about five years of age, um, left me in the clutches of this predator. And I had no way, as far as I could see through the lens of a 12-year-old boy or a 13-year-old boy, uh, to know that what was happening to me was actually wrong in the sense that uh, it was much more serious than the crimes that I had committed. I was concerned of my father's anger um, in relation to how he would respond if, if I quit this job where I had to pay back money. So I was on the horns of a dilemma. Yes. So how, how long did the abuse continue? I went on for about eight or nine months um, during the period of which I had to keep that job, but it escalated very, very sharply. So it started as abuse in his bedroom, uh, in the, the nursery uh, in which he was, um, which he owned. But eventually he called it sharing the wealth and taking me to a local beat. Uh, a beat, I'm not sure if the Americans are familiar with the term, is a public toilet usually where uh, homosexuals hang out and he thought that, um, and this is his words, not mine, he would share the wealth, mm. uh, which of course were putting lacing me into a cubicle and it was a case of take a number. Um, naturally, that wasn't particularly a good place for a 13-year-old boy to be as I was by the time that was happening. Uh, and uh, clearly it had a, a, a fairly profound impact on me uh, and that became increasingly obvious uh, as I grew older. So one of the obvious thing that comes to mind, which may, may not be so obvious, is did you actually tell anybody or did you keep it not to at, yourself? Not at that time. In fact, I didn't tell anybody for another 20 years, long after <sighs> I started to recover. Um, and it's a, it's a curious story because uh, it came up almost immediately uh, when I entered Parliament in the Northern Territory. And so I was on the horns of this moral dilemma uh, do I keep silent or do I speak, uh, come out and, and speak my piece? So I'd served for 15 years as a police officer and never told a soul. Um, and that is part of, of, of the legacy of this sort of conduct is that by the time that I started getting better, 
Um, I was an extremely fragile and frail human being at an emotional and spiritual level. I wasn't looking for a fight uh, with my former abuser. I was looking to simply get my life together. And so he pushed it into the background, pushed it into the background. And it wasn't until I entered Parliament that certain circumstances became manifest and I realised that I was duty bound as a leader of the community um, to make or, or correct this uh, horrendous series of events, uh, which is what I did. Uh, the police were involved uh, and the fellow finally went to jail for his crimes. That's that's good news. But one of, one of the things that comes to mind, and it came to mind almost immediately when you started talking about it, when I read your bio, I thought, okay, Please, if it's not too difficult, but I suspect that the reason that you didn't speak about it for so long is because you probably felt a sense of shame. Would that be correct? I was never, ever going to tell anybody. Um, this was a case of, of somebody um, who was sodomizing me. You've got to remember this was happening back in the 1970s. Um, wow. And he was taking me into public places where, uh, in a small cubicle, any number of people could have a go. Um, this is not the sort of thing you wear as a badge of honour. The reason I talk about it today is that I've gone through the journey, um, and it, it's not a simple journey. Um, I, one of the things I'd like to urge upon your listeners is that uh, this is, even if you have the, the sudden desire uh, to correct your life, don't think that that's the end of the journey, that's the beginning of the journey. Mm. Agreed. Um, and so uh, I started a journey, and I was extremely frail when I started that journey. Um, you know, my alcoholism, which was may or may not have been associated with the abuse, certainly was getting in my way. Uh, I had lied my way into the police force. Um, you know, people who are listening to this podcast will understand, I think, uh, the two faces, the one that you show to the world, yes. uh, which you try your best to be a competent, comfortable operator, considering uh, convincing everybody how happy you are. And the other one, which is a, a, a blender of, of turmoil. Um, but eventually the blender of turmoil becomes so overwhelming that the face just crumbles away. Mm. Uh, and that's precisely what happened to me. So I would lied my way effectively into the police force. They used to have a thing called the police cadet system in, in the Northern Territory, which was like an apprentice policeman. You, you joined at 17. Uh, and you uh, became a recruit eventually and then worked your way into the police force. So I was holding enough, well enough together to uh, to get through the cadet system. But even then I was identified as having problems and uh, and those difficulties continued. So eventually when the collapse uh, happened, uh, when I was sliding into what felt like a tapering crevasse, and every time that I tried to struggle to get out of the crevasse, um, the struggle would actually wedge me more tightly towards the tapering end at the bottom and it felt like it was constricting my chest um, so to the point where I physically had occasionally had trouble drawing my next breath. It was that crushing and emotional um, condition. Um, and I identified the alcohol abuse as the problem, which in hindsight was not such a bad thing because it then led to a pathway of growth, which took many years uh, to travel. And I suppose in many respects, I continue to travel it today. Yeah. One of my questions, well, John, with that is just with the, uh, what, what was the real turning point where, you know, you, you, there's so much happening in your life in those, in those teens and twenties um, with the, with the alcohol and drug abuse, you could have really gone in a different direction. What was the real turning point that took you, to where you are now. Look, Hamish, I'll tell you what the turning point was. Imagine a young police officer falling out of the air conditioning system at the Darwin Casino because he thought it was a good idea to climb into it, getting arrested and being dragged off by uh, his own colleagues, uh, then being told in no uncertain terms by your sergeant the next day that your police career was effectively over right. unless something fundamentally happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, turn the motivation is fear, Hamish. Yes. Pure, pure unadulterated fear. Yep. Fear is a great motivator because, I mean, in, in terms of listening to you, uh, uh, like one of the questions that I was going to ask you, which I think you've answered, is what was your worst moment and perhaps what you just described was that worst moment? Yeah, Nathan, that's a, it's an interesting question. 
the worst moment was what was happening between my ears, not in the physical world around me. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced an earthquake. But the one thing about an earthquake is, is that the fundamental assumption that the ground under your feet is solid is suddenly, be, is suddenly challenged. Psychologically and spiritually, could you imagine a world in where the ground under your feet is never solid? It is always moving, it is always liquid, and no matter what you try and do, uh, it becomes even more violent and eruptive with the passage of time. Um, when you have no touchstone, no place to lay your hand and say, this is a truth, uh, then, then you are exposed. And moreover, um, insanity was washing over me in increasing waves. And, and I call it insanity because even to this day, I suspect there is not much between myself and a junkie or an alcoholic lying in a park that we so often see. Yeah but for the change that happened in my head and, to a degree, in my heart. Yes, and what you, what you speak is, is quite real. I mean, at one point in my own life, I wound up homeless. Um, so this war that you talk about or this sense of no ground under your feet, uh, because I also come from a very difficult, painful background, it was like that for me. That didn't change in terms of my relationship then with my uh, my superiors in the police force. Um, of course, I was making dumber and dumber decisions. But the other thing that I recall is that the uh, alcohol abuse had become so profound that I was failing to effectively do even the most basic functions. So uh, I remember on one particular occasion, I was asked to fill out an accident report form, as you always do when two cars collide. Uh, and it's a simple tick and flick sheet. Um, you fill in some details and then you, you tick a whole bunch of boxes. The report came back to me and I had failed to fill out about half the form because I no longer had the mental capacity to concentrate long enough to fill out an A4 size sheet of paper with tick and flick answers. Mm. Um, for yeah. that reason, they then placed me into a radio room to keep me away from the public. and. They protected me as much as they could, but eventually they got to the point where they were saying to me, that protection now disappears. Um, and that, that was a confronting time, but one that was fundamentally honest. Mm. Um, yes, and, like an intervention, if you will? Uh, yeah, not deliberately described in those days. Uh, police forces and, and, and management of people with psychological issues was, was a lot more... Uh, basic than it is now and fundamental. Essentially, um, I was an embarrassment to the police force and they didn't want to keep me. Uh, so I had to get my stuff together. Uh, and then after that particular event in the Darwin Casino, um, I sought help from, from some people who were very, very kind uh, and patient with me. But I knew at that time that I had reached that waters the shed moment. Some people would call it a rock bottom. And I realised that Time had come that what was happening could not continue. I was going to go mad, I was going to go to jail, or I was going to die. Uh, and I that was a threshold moment for me. Yes. I don't, I don't remember much of my life without the presence of the emotion of fear, Hamish. Yeah. Yeah. I can believe it. Very familiar. Yeah. Oh, just one thing that um, Nathan mentioned in your bio, John, sort of in the early 20s where you, it culminated in that moral emotional collapse and I understand that moral and emotional collapse but he also said the there was the spiritual collapse and the new path in life now most people talk about a spiritual awakening or something lifting them in that context I haven't actually heard that spiritual collapse as well Hamish it's a fair question um, and in this world of increasing atheism uh, and I understand the atheist philosophy. I, I sometimes call myself an atheist who occasionally lapses into Catholicism. Um, <laughs> but, here's, but here's the deal, is that we're a spiritual, uh, a spiritual being. Yes. Uh, we, seek, we seek beauty. Uh, we seek all sorts of things as, as a human being. Mm. And so it's more than just merely emotional. The connection that we seek with art, with music, poetry, whatever, is a connection which gives us purpose. Um, it is, I don't think it's peculiar to the human species, but it's certainly central to us mm. that we need a purpose to yes. exist. 
One of the things that undermines the human condition, particularly in this day and age, is a sense of purposelessness. Um, an absence of purpose is spiritual cancer. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There's another aspect, too, to what you mentioned, which I remember encountering in many of the 12-step groups. One of the things they spoke about repeatedly was spiritual bankruptcy. That's precisely right, uh, Nathan, and I think that those 12-step groups um, uh, have identified or certainly touched on something there because it's more than just a mental structure. It's more than just an emotional structure. It, is, it goes to the very heart of who we are as human beings. Um, and I look at human beings. I mean, look, last time I checked, I have two eyes, one nose, two ears, two hands, two legs. So does an alcoholic lying in a park clutching a bottle. So what is difference about us? Um, if you open us up, we have the same organs, the same digestive tract, so physically we are not fundamentally different. However, what is the difference between that person, let's say somebody like Mother Teresa, or the Pope, um, or the Grand Mufti of Mecca? Uh, and there is something fundamentally different in that those other people that I've described have taken their sense of purpose to, to an exalted level. Now, I've never claimed to, to share company with those people, but what I did know, or what I did learn very quickly, is that I needed to get my spiritual being into, into, into proper structure. Mm. And so I set myself a little task as I was recovering, and I said I would have wanted to um, condense the world or the word purpose of life into one word uh, and I set myself a task of two years to go and read as much material as I could so I read Islamic works, Buddhist works, self-help works, listened to some Tony Robbins tapes, uh, read the Bible, all sorts of different um, books, uh, Scott Peck's book, um, uh, The Road Less Travelled I think was is a well-worn path. And it wasn't about necessarily finding the word, I mean I expected to find love or entropy at the end of it. Uh, but it was about the journey of learning about the spiritual condition of the human being uh, and how that filled me with a sense of wonderment at some of the people that, that, that have occupied spiritual roles in the past. St. So, you know, Thomas Aquinas, um, uh, any other number of, of religious characters, um, both um, charitable and otherwise, um, you know, people like Gandhi, they all give uh, given their life to the spiritual pursuit mm -hmm. and the advancement of the human purpose. So in terms of your recovery, what were the major hurdles that you had to overcome? Um, fear. Yeah. No, Hamish fear. mentioned it before, Nathan. Yeah. Uh, an, a blinding fear of failing. Um, the other thing was is that I was also obsessed with resentment and resentment's an interesting word because if you think about what it means the the scent part you know sentience uh, sensibilities those sorts of things it means about feeling the re part means feeling it again so if every time that you resent something you feel it again now i don't know about you guys but when i practice the art of resentment um, i managed to distill it so every single time that i thought about an issue that drove my resentments I felt it more comprehensively each and every time. Just sort of taking another step further with the journey that you've been on, John, where look at, looking at what you've been doing, the the roles that you've held in, in government um, as Minister for Health, Minister for Mental Health Services, Minister for Disabilities and Child Protection, the space that you've been working in, the, the level that you've got to, it's obviously it's been a big journey for you to make some big significant changes uh, in this space. The roles that you've held, you've you would have clearly made some significant changes in in mental health in in this area. Look, Hamish, let me point one of the ones that uh, has been nationally acknowledged, both by the Prime Minister um, and uh, his his advisers, including people like Marcia Langdon, mm -hmm. um, was a program that I established in the Northern Territory Correction System called Sentence to a Job. Sentence um, to a Job. Yep. yep. Uh, and people can go, I welcome your listeners to Google it yep. uh, and you'll find a bit more about it. But essentially it worked, it worked like this, is that over the period of the years that I was a police officer, 
I guess I would have arrested about a thousand bad guys. <laughs> um, of that, five, maybe six, are what I would have called broom closet villains. These are the ones that you lock in a broom closet and you never, ever let them out. They yes. are just broken units. Yeah. But if that's true, 995 or 994 were what I would have called um, people who were just drunk, stupid, or more often than not drunk and stupid at the time of their offending. Yes. So who are they when they're in prison? They're a highly compliant bunch of people who have a very low security rating because they're not at risk. So what I started doing was saying to these guys, okay, we're going to make you responsible. Go and get a job. So we found them jobs in the community, which were full-time paying jobs. Uh, every night they then came back to prison. Uh, they were placed in their cells. Uh, and then they were charged rent for those cells. So they had to pay $125 a week rent. We also made them pay 5% of their income into a victim's assistance fund, which meant that they were actually literally paying their debt to society back in cash. Um, the rest of the money was then held in trust. So one example that springs to mind was a fellow who was a drug dealer. Um, we got him a job. We ended up getting his uh, electric electrician's apprenticeship out of the way. He left prison with $22,500 in his back pocket and a job to go to mm. and a sense of purpose that he developed while he was in prison. Um, that is a fundamentally different model than the yeah. rack and stack model. You just yes. simply stick in a concrete box and turn over the egg timer. And when they, when they get out, they've got nothing except the, the habits that they used to have and they, they do it again. It's, um, They're going to go back to the... Yeah. They go yeah. back to the same environment for yeah. whence they came. Is that program yeah. is, is that program still running? Yes, thank God the new government in the Northern Territory has uh, has taken that program on. Uh, but if you you know, we had one prisoner employed by the prison system itself, and his job was to drive the bus to get other prisoners to work. Right. Um, so we've realised. And then we expand the program even further to, to adopt training. So we started making all sort of products. We made cattle yards, equipment, uh, tire furniture, all sorts of things. And then we got a training training advisor, a, um, a training organisation, an RTO, a registered training organisation, to come in and oversee the training that we were doing so that these guys, as they were going through their security classification process, were, were earning skills in the workshops with product that we were then selling into the marketplace, uh, once they had those skills, they were more employable and it was easier to land them into jobs outside of the correction system. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting what you talk about because I've heard about these kinds of things in the past, but this is the first time that I've actually been able to speak to anybody who's ever been involved in it. So it was pretty interesting mm -hmm. to me to, to be able to hear that. So this is an example of how you were able to turn your life around. But, you know, if we're looking at your thinking process, what were a couple of the things, if you wouldn't mind sharing, that went on in your thinking process that allowed you to change from this place of being stuck in this fear, or maybe that didn't change, I don't know, but, but to go from where you were to being able to give back into the community in such a profound way? Um, in short... It was a change of what was happening in my heart and how I saw the world. Uh, I've just described to you two human beings, one who was frightened, one who felt like he was sliding into a, a, a greasy abyss from which he couldn't escape, and another, and another guy who uh, describes uh, seeing art and falling in love with a painting because of its just staggering beauty. Uh, a fellow who reads a poem uh, and then suddenly realises that the depth of understanding of the person who wrote that poem uh, is magnificent. And I, whilst that person died hundreds of years ago through the beauty of their work, they were able to reach and touch my human consciousness um, in a most magnificent way. What's the difference between those two people? Essentially somebody who has abandoned their fear uh, and learned to accept that the world will always be a scary place. And, and that's a fact. Uh, what I'd urge your listeners to understand is that the world is frightening. It still scares me some days today. But there's not much I can do personally today about the nuclear threat out of North Korea. What I can do is look after what's happening between my ears and my heart and learn techniques 
um, and apply those techniques to making sure that my fears are rational and that my resentments are restrained. Um, it is e easy to decay in that space. Yes. And there's something else that comes to mind. Please tell me if I'm correct or not. Would it be safe to say that one of the things that happened as a result of going through this journey, that you developed something that is known as awareness? Absolutely, Nathan. Um, Self-awareness. You would yes. understand that a creature that is afraid, if you, if you look at my evolution as a, as a human being, uh, I went through, uh, if you like, the Cretaceous period of, of, of evolution where there was a, uh, a, an expansion of my worldview, but I was still an animal in the field, and so that all of my responses were animalistic. Something threatens me, I get frightened. Uh, something hurts me, I resent it. Um, uh, something uh, confronts me, I get angry at it. Um, but that's not awareness. That is a Pavlovian response to an external threat. Awareness is suddenly being able to rise above the circumstances that you find yourself in and realise what is actually going on and then knowing or learning the, the truth that there are techniques which can be brought to bear that change that. And it's that raising above. It's about becoming conscious, moving from the id through to the ego and even the super ego, if, uh, to use a bit of Freud, um, so that you can become more conscious and more self-aware. And the best way to do that is hang around people who have achieved that, mm. either through literature or people who are alive today. Yeah, there are many ways. Like uh, Until awareness dawns, in many ways, we're like walking robots. But when America, awareness dawns and we suddenly begin to realize a certain other things, then we can then we can begin to function from a different place. And you know, thinking about what what you said, like, well, there are a number of things that I would like to ask you. But in terms of the people that had helped you in the past. What was the best piece of advice that you ever got along your journey? <laughs> oh, that's a very good one. Uh, the, the best piece of advice I ever got was the most practical piece of advice, don't drink. Uh, so to this <laughs> day, I, I, I don't drink liquor. Um, that is, it's a very hard thing to quantify because I had read so much good advice uh, over the years. Um, but I think... If I was to distill the one most important value that now exists is the one of acceptance. Yes. Accept, yep. accept what is happening around you and accept who you are. Look, a lot of people refuse to accept certain things. I'm the victim of a, of a, a pedophile. I can tell you now that the guy who, who committed those crimes against me will never, ever, ever apologise to me. Um, he blames me for going to jail. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. But the That's point is, the typical behaviour of an abuser who, who refuses to acknowledge their crimes. And as a side this, note, this is something I've encountered directly, and I'm not surprised, actually, that you, you are saying that. Yeah, but here's the important thing, Nathan. Yeah. He, he hasn't touched me for 35 years. So I have two choices. I can either continue to wait with bated breath for him to come and apologise to me. But if I do that, I place my happiness and my uh, joy into his hands. Yeah. I perpetuate victimhood. Um, yes. I'll be damned if I'm going to do that. Um, what I've decided is that this bloke has already suffered the consequences of his own actions. Um, it would be self-indulgent of me to continue to refuse to accept the reality of what happened. Um, and I've just said I accept it. I'm neither proud of it nor embarrassed by it. It's just what happened. And in accepting it, I've been able to abandon it and let it go away. Mm. With that acceptance, is there any sort of level of forgiveness that goes with it? Ah, oh, yeah, look, forgiveness is a Christian uh, 
concept, I think, is a very functional and useful tool. Um, do I forgive this guy? Frankly, I don't care anymore. Yep, um, that, yep. uh, That's even better. Yep. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. You know, I look at yeah. him and, you know, this guy, if, if I feel anything towards him, it's, it's a mild irritation. But the reason I'm irritated at him is that he was actually a very smart man with a bright future. He had a lot to offer the community mm. in which he lived. Mm. And he chose to, to engage in this ridiculous indulgence of raping children. Yeah. Now, this is, uh, I look at him and I, I feel mild irritation that, that he has wasted his intelligence on such stupidity. And I think that, that um, that's the only reason I'm angry at him is that now is because of his wastefulness of his own life. Yeah. Um, and he's done irreparable damage. I suspect he'll never cry, climb out of the hole that he's in. Um, and I feel sad for him that, that that's the culmination of his existence. Mm. Well, I've, de I've decided that that, as a point of reference, is something that I can use to become a better person. I don't give a rat's ass about this bloke anymore. Yeah. Um, he's long since departed from my life. Uh, the impact that he makes on my life is a touchstone for advancement. So I now look at the experience, and while I'll never say I'm grateful for the experience, it is a touchstone for me to say, all right, that's what I don't want to happen to myself, and that's what I don't want to happen to my own children in turn. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the way you're living now, um, what is a personal habit that you use on a daily basis? As a result self, of what happened? Self-review. Um, look, I am by no means um, uh, given granted absolution for my mistakes. And do I make mistakes? Hell yes, I make lots of mistakes. Um, and I make sure that when I do make those mistakes, I acknowledge those mistakes and where they're necessary, uh, make amends to those people that I have offended. Um, yeah. It's about keeping the slate clean. Uh, and living a moral and upright life, not because the, the church or some biblical yeah. text tells me to do so. It's just, it keeps the the emotional framework of John Elfrink uncluttered. Yes, absolutely true. So, so for those people who have been listening to us, if they want to get any more information about you, where would they go for that? Oh, well, there's a Wikipedia entry, um, which uh, is fairly lengthy in relation to my political career. Um, and uh, I think that you'll find any number of, uh, of news articles, both good and bad. I mean, not everything in my political career went perfectly either. Um, <laughs> no. But that's part of the adventure of life. Yeah. Um, and you'll find no, sh you know, Google John Elfrink, you'll find no shortage of information about John Elfrink. But... Um, but here's the deal, is that what I would say to your listeners is learn to love life passionately. Engage with it. Um, if you are unhappy where you are, move. Um, there are The world is actually a surprisingly embracing place. If you choose to move and throw yourself under the, the bus of uncertainty, you'll find that when it runs over you, it's actually not so bad. Yeah. Yeah, I, re I really appreciate you taking Excellent. the time to be be with us this this evening to talk with us, to share your journey, which I'm sure will be very inspirational to a lot of people. I, I really like what you shared, what you've learned, and that you've been as as incredibly open about what has happened to you as you have been. Look, Nathan and Hamish, here's the deal: the reason that I stay as open as I am is not because I'm proud of my past. Some people will uh, will hang the drapers in front of them and this is who I am and, and look, 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 look at me. It's not about that. I like to share one important truth is that uh, I give of myself. Uh, I've had this experience. I'm, as I said, I'm not proud of it. I'm just not embarrassed by it. Yeah. And if somebody else listening to your broadcast today is touched by what I say, then I am enormously grateful Yes. Yes. Agreed. It, it is interesting that when we give of ourselves in a particular way that we actually feel better in a way that one can't really describe it. It just does something to us and for us that 
one can't really put it into words too well. I think there are a number of in, inherent paradoxes in getting better. One is you have to surrender so that you can win. The other yes. one is to give of yourself so you can gain. Yes, absolutely true. Um, and these are the, this is the, the paradoxical nature of, of being human. Uh, it's part of the human experience. But feel the, the sand under your feet, feel the sun on your back, um, run your fingers through some grass, smell a rose, and realise that your time is finite. Um, use it, use it to love, be passionate, um, accept your mistakes, and enjoy who you are. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. John, I think you're going to help a lot of people really just stop and think and become aware and that accept change of yeah. thought. It's yeah, it's been really great. So I'd, I, once again, I want to thank you for, for being with us this evening. Thanks, John. My very great pleasure, Nathan uh, Hamish. Um, uh, enjoy your day, gentlemen, and I hope that your listeners um, who are listening to this uh, to this podcast also enjoy these. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will learn a lot. So, for those of you who have been listening, my name is Nathan Siegel. With me is my colleague Hamish Baston out of Australia, and John Elferink, also out of Australia, and we are the Thought Hackers. We will see you next time. You've been listening to The Thought Hackers. Make sure you subscribe and get each new episode emailed straight to you so you don't miss a show. And have a look at our resources page where you will find programs, audios and books that will create change in your thoughts.